Well, welcome, Sandra. It's a pleasure to meet with you. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Um, you're obviously uh, well-versed in a lot of these shamanic subjects and it worked a great deal on it on them for a number of decades. Um, let's begin with a very basic question. Shamanism uh, conventionally is a religion associated with comparatively primitive tribes. And can you say a little bit about shamanism in a present day context and how shamanism is practiced by Americans today? Absolutely. So shamanism is actually the oldest universal spiritual practice that exists. And from the archaeological evidence, and anthropologists are always fighting about the date, but it looks like the practice dates back over 100,000 years. So you can only imagine that a practice that started 100,000 years ago had to keep evolving to, um, to meet the needs of the people and what was happening for them. And so here we are in a Western culture. Um, I've been teaching shamanism around the world for 40 years now. And the Western culture, where we are today and where we've been, um, there are certain issues that we have that indigenous people did not have. And so the beauty of shamanism, first of all, one of the reasons it's been around so long is that it gets good results. Um, I know this sounds uh, a little harsh, but there are shamanic cultures back in the olden days where if the shaman couldn't heal the people um, and couldn't help them find food, the shaman was actually killed. So shamanism has always been a very result-oriented practice. It's not, um, oh, isn't it nice to do a ceremony or take a shamanic journey? That's not what shamanism is about. It's does it heal the people? Does it heal the land? Does it make our lives better? And so it's a practice that has gotten really good results. And so for me, when I started practicing shamanism, I was a psychotherapist. And I, I heard back, back then people weren't traveling to shamanic cultures 40 years ago. There were just a few. But I'd hear from a couple of students different ceremonies that were done for healing. And I said to myself, this can't be bridged into our modern day culture there's no way to work with this in a session with a client. And so shamanism, again, has evolved so that we can work in a modern culture. So for example, many, many, many years ago, um, a student got onto um, President Clinton's climate change committee and was able to, through talking to the spirits, make some really good uh, suggestions and where they made some really good changes. We have shamanic practitioners going into schools, helping children look at how they can live a balanced life connected to nature. We have people who are dealing with unbelievable trauma who are getting help from Western practitioners where oftentimes indigenous cultures don't understand the physical issues that we're dealing with today. We have priests and nuns practicing shamanism. And of course, we have doctors and nurses practicing shamanism, lawyers practicing shamanism, besides just people who are seeking help in their own lives or who want to bring the work into their community. So we've really, um, over the years, we've really been able to have people be interested in shamanism at a time on the planet where we need help and they can actually direct help to our culture where uh, oftentimes uh, methods, healing methods and ceremonies from indigenous cultures 
just don't work in a Western world. They're not trans. They're not translatable. That's what I found. Well, thank you, Sandra. That was uh, very uh, interesting and useful. One principal difference between conventional psychotherapeutic approaches and shamanism has to do with the spirits, as you mentioned. Them. Shamanism is based on the reality of the spirit world and our capacity to relate with it, whereas modern uh, psychology denies that there's any such thing. Um, so maybe, could you talk a little bit about that difference? Yeah. Um, so I'll tell you what happened to me as a psychotherapist. Um, I moved to Santa Fe and I had two separate practices. This was 40 years ago when I moved here. And I had a business card as a psychotherapist and I had a business card as a shamanic counselor, you know, back in those days. I stuck to the legal, you know, having two different business cards. And I started to notice that my shamanic clients, and when I mean shamanic clients, I was teaching them how to meet their own helping spirits. And shamanism, the most powerful ceremony that we have is what's called the shamanic journey a practice of direct revelation where everybody has their own divine helping spirits who can help them and people can become their own authorities. And I found that my shamanic clients who were journeying to their spirits, their spirits were helping them, their spirits were giving them advice, their spirits were healing them, and they were moving so much faster than my psychotherapy clients where we seem to just be going around in a loop. And that could have been, you know, um, uh, I wasn't a great therapist, I don't know. <laughs> but um, at some point, I saw my shamanic clients moving so fast. I told my psychotherapy clients that I was no longer doing traditional therapy if they wanted to move with me and become a shamanic client they could otherwise i would refer them out to another psychotherapist and everybody moved with me except one person so the difference with shamanism first of all is that we can give a client the ability to have their own self direct revelation so they get their own answers instead of having to follow what another authority figure is sharing with them. And oftentimes that's good information, but oftentimes the therapist doesn't have the same perspective that the spirits have. You know, the spirits have no body. They're out in the divine realms looking down on the human condition. And they have such a they have such a different perspective to what's going on um, for us and in the world, and um, but some people in who are in therapy want that comfort of having um, that therapist. So it really depends on people's personality. Do they want to become their own authority figure or? Um, or do they want the help of somebody else? Um, but I see the practices of being very different. A lot of psychotherapists are now bridging shamanism into their practices. Uh, they do teach their clients how to journey as well as doing the psychotherapy work. And so that's another way that shamanism has evolved and has been um, is bridging into psychotherapy a bit. And then um, the other important uh, point to understand is when a person goes into psychotherapy, it's the therapist who does the diagnosis of what's going on for them. In shamanism, if I go to my helping spirit and say, this is what my diagnosis is of my client, my, my helping spirit says to me, Oh, Sandra, that's such a beautiful theory, but that has absolutely nothing going. That has nothing to do with what's happening with your client right now. 
And so the beauty of the work as a psychotherapist is I can defer to the helping spirits for what they're seeing, what the client really needs. Because I think part of the looping for me with my psychotherapy clients was that um, we weren't hitting the core issue. So we kept on having to talk around and around where what I love about shamanism is the helping spirit I've worked with for 40 years now. He's never been wrong. And the very first thing he does uh, when I journey for a client is he says what the core issue is and what needs to be healed. And once you get that core issue, everything falls into place after that. Everything falls into place. So, Well, one thing you've just mentioned is uh, the shamanic journey. And could you uh, give viewers uh, some idea of what the shamanic journey is and entails? Yeah. Um, uh, again, everything in shamanism is about a ceremony. And a ceremony is a way for us to come back to a place of stability and center. You know, because our ego, our mind gets so um, disturbed by what's going on in our lives and what's going on in the world. And when we perform a ceremony in shamanism, we have to, um, we move away from our ego. We step away from our humanness and we allow our spirit to connect with um, helping spirits. So in shamanism, it's believed that when we're born, all of us, whether we believe in the practice of shamanism or not, that there are these helping spirits who come in, who um, volunteer to help us, protect us, keep us safe and healthy throughout our lives. They won't, um, they won't prevent our big lessons. So yes, tragedy comes into our life because we have to grow. But it's believed that we always have these spirits around us. And so a shamanic journey is a ceremony where we move our ego through, pers through um, preparation work that we do, singing and dancing, meditation, spending time in nature. We want to step away from our ego so that our ego is not coming into the journey but it's spirit, our spirit, because we're body, mind, and spirit. So it's our spirit uh, speaking to these divine spirits. In shamanism, it's talked about that there are three worlds where these divine spirits live. Uh, the lower world, which seems real earthy, um, it's really a wonderful place. And they're what are called helping spirits, power animals, guardian spirits. Um, guardian spirits could be a tree or a plant or a fairy. Um, there's teachers, there's mystics, there's ancestors, religious figures. And then we go to the middle world where we have the opportunity to speak with nature, but from um, the unseen, working in the unseen, where we step into a different dimension of reality with nature and we can talk to trees and plants as indigenous people used to do and say, what are your healing properties? What's your story? What's your life been like? And so we really get to communicate with nature, which is probably the biggest um, diagnosis of illness in our culture today is how disconnected people are from nature. And then the third world that's talked about is the upper world. So there's the world tree, the roots go down to the lower world, the trunk is the middle world, the branches go to the upper world, and we climb up um, we climb up different tools and ways to get to the upper world. And, and that's really where a lot of uh, what we call teachers in human form live. Again, they could be ancestors, religious figures, people see goddesses, gods, 
um, from all different cultures. Um, teachers can be very surprising. It could be a young child um, who comes in as a teacher. So we have this variety of spirits that we can go to. And once we start to journey, we learn who our helping spirits are, because when we ask, um, when we journey to the lower world and we journey to the upper world and we ask for a teacher or power animal or guardian spirit, we wait to see who shows up. So we don't pick them, they pick us. And then um, we forge an amazing relationship so that whenever we go into a shamanic journey, our spirits are there. We know they're going to be there. We know who our spirits are. I, I've been working with this one spirit for 40 years, so how can I not trust what he says? He's never been wrong in my, my life. So it, it's amazing to have that kind of support, especially in the world that we live in. Now, how people actually enter into a journey and can move their humanness out of the way so that they can, um, so that their spirit can fly um, into the unseen realms where they can have this direct revelation and these conversations with these amazing, wonderful spirits is typically in most cultures some kind of percussion is used to go into an altered state. So in most cultures a drum is used, that's what I use. Rattles are used, I also use rattles. You also see people use uh, bowls and bells in different countries. A didgeridoo, click sticks might be used in Australia. Um, you know, there's so many different instruments, and then there are plant spirits that many shamans use to go into the unseen realms. One of the things I've been teaching is plant spirits are wonderful, but we can use a drum, we can use rattles, and we can make the information uh, incredibly accessible to us on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, when we use a drum because we can still um, hold our consciousness and we can get really practical answers like what do I do in the next minute? What do I do tomorrow? Um, instead of some of the uh, bigger, bigger uh, planetary cosmic things we might be shown uh, using plant spirits. So uh, what I love about shamanic journeying is how practical it is. It's just really practical. On this topic of communicating with nature and nature spirits, perhaps the um, so one of the most enigmatic creatures uh, is the bee. Uh, mm -hmm. And the bee has many esoteric dimensions, both symbolically and all sorts of other things. Maybe you could talk a little bit about bee shamanism. Do you, do you know anything about that? Uh, well, I've read books about bee shamanism. Um, the, the teacher that I am and the message that I've put out for 40 years now, so people know I'm really strict about this and I'm very public about this. Um, it's really clear that every time a helping spirit comes to you, it's bringing a very unique gift that you personally need not that anybody else needs, it's what you need. And so I feel one of the downfalls of shamanism is again, it's a practice to empower yourself so that you become your own authority. And so I tell people, if you wanna know about what the symbolism of be is for you, journey to be and ask be for yourself. But I, I um, I have a hard time, again, I'm very public about it, I have a hard time with all the books that are written that um, B means this, and this creature means this, and this creature means that, because what I found is that people actually miss the unique gifts that the universe is trying to share, because again, they wanted to be, uh, they got into generic work, they got into 
what one author discovered and is their, is their practice. But we really need to keep our authority. And if we want to know what B is about, what the symbolism about, I tell people to go to B and talk to B. One thing that occurs in the course of these spirit conversations is the possibility of being deceived. Now, in your new book, Walking Through Darkness, your first chapter is on coyote, and which is, is well known as something of a trickster figure, but um, often portrayed in a somewhat cartoonish, wily coyote kind of way. Uh, and your chapter on it suggests that, yes, actual deception is possible, not necessarily through that particular spirit, but the deception is part of the game. Could you comment a bit about this and how you sort through deception? Yeah, so um, in, in, in my book, um, Walking Through Darkness, um, I, we actually, I co-wrote it with Lynn Roberts, and we actually used animals just as metaphors. Um, we weren't talking about them as real spirits. So um, what I was talking about in that chapter is, so uh, the book is about when we're going through darkness. And so I use myself, the book is about my roadmap of how I got through um, the dark night of the soul. And so I have a, a disorder um, that developed um, nine years ago. And so the book is about how I've really worked with this. And what happened to me and happens to all kinds of everybody is you have something rare, you have something that's not known. And the first thing that happens is all these people jump out at you and say, I can help you. Uh, I'll help you. I know exactly how to help you. I can cure you in one month. I can cure you in two months. Just do whatever I say to do. And so that whole chapter was about how when we're walking through the dark night of the soul, it's not spirits that try to trick us. The spirits are trying to help us if we would listen to them. It's people we meet can act as uh, coyotes, can act as tricksters who try and deceive us and try and um, bring us to a wrong path. A lot of them are really heart-centered and really compassionate and feel that they can help, but um, plant seeds of hope that aren't going to actually grow. So what I was trying to share in that chapter is how people who are dealing with a lot of darkness are often prey to human beings who want to be authorities and say, follow me, do this, and I can help you. And what we all find, those of us who are dealing with mysterious things right now, because there are a lot of them, <laughs> um, we all find that until we go inside our body and talk to our body and soul ourselves, we're always going to be deceived by other humans because they actually don't know what's happening for us. So I was using coyote as a metaphor. Um, yeah. I, I know people I know people get lost in how spirits deceive human beings, but I've actually never taught that in 40 years. I believe your intention creates your reality. If you believe the spirits are going to give you good information, they're going to give you good information. Well, one of the things that precipitates dark nights of the soul is uh, the deaths of loved ones. And perhaps you could talk about the shamanic approach to this subject, both in terms of the bereaved and working with the recently deceased. Yeah, so um, in, in what I try to teach people, especially clients who come to see me, but I also teach this in our workshops, 
For some people, the next step of their healing process is life. And for some people, the next healing step of their process is death. We demonize death in this culture. We do everything to try to avoid death. A lot of people are terrified of death, don't understand what's coming. But death is the next step of our evolution uh, to bring us to a new dimension of reality. And so um, uh, in working with death from a shamanic point of view, it's not so much trying to keep people alive. It's trying to help people um, have a good journey back home. And I teach people one of the best things that you can do for a person who's dying is to really get into a meditative state and to again move away from your ego move away from your mind and drop into spirit and see yourself as a being of light because that's what we all are our spiritual identity is actually light that's who we are is actually light and when you sit with somebody who's dying in a state of light it's amazing the peace that it brings for them and so um, we really have to learn how to live in this culture. We immediately say, no, grandma, no, no, mom, no, dad, you're not going to die. You're not going to die. Stop talking like that. That's crazy talk. But that's not what people need. People need uh, people who are going to hold space, listen to them as they talk about their memories, their fears sit with them in meditation, be in a place of light. And then once they go, um, from a shamanic point of view, most people transcend out of the, what we call the middle world. I talked about the middle world as being a place of nature. And the middle world is earth school. We're here to learn. We're here to evolve. And so when a person dies, they don't belong in earth school anymore. They've graduated earth school. They might need some more teachings and healing, but they basically uh, graduated. And so it's time for them to leave the middle world in a Judeo-Christian culture. Of course, we all want to go up. So we talk about people going up to the heavens, going back to the divine, going to the upper world, going to beautiful territories. And um, so from a shamanic point of view, people typically do that on their own. And different cultures give the soul um, uh, different timelines to grieve their own death. So most cultures give like about three days before they would bury or cremate um, a person because it was time for the the soul, the spirit, to be able to grieve the death. Um, so I would never do any work to help somebody cross over for at least three days. There are cultures who do say that um, a soul has a year um, to grieve their own death before they're moved on. So if everything goes right, and we know how that is, um, if everything goes right, um, we all transcend on our own. But from a shamanic point of view, it's understood that there are circumstances where a soul gets stuck in the middle world. Um, they don't know they died. So I've worked with uh, students. This is one of my specialties. I, I've worked with students where we go back um, to the Vietnam War. Or we go back to an airplane crash and everybody's wondering where the ambulances are. Why isn't anybody here? They don't even know that they died. You oftentimes have to take them back to their homes and show them how their family has aged and their loved ones have died. That's how long they've been gone. And then once they're convinced, you can start to escort them up to the upper world. Um, oftentimes we have to do psychotherapy on spirits to let them know that um, 
they don't belong here anymore. Uh, a lot of times um, a husband or wife or lover won't leave the middle world because they want to take care of their loved ones. And so in that case, it has to be explained that um, they can't help their loved ones while they're stuck in the middle world. They need to move on. So uh, again, there's a lot that goes on and what we call this in shamanism is psychopomp work. And psychopomp is a Greek word which means conductor of souls. So if a person dies in a terrorism attack, in a war, is shot, uh, drug abuse, suicide, um, wasn't expected, you know, it just wasn't expected. This death was a surprise and the soul gets um, confused. So those are kinds of cases where we have to do what's called psychopomp work of talking to the soul, letting them know a loved one is waiting for them. Sometimes a loved one will come down and will actually help. But it's not okay to wander the earth as a ghost, basically. We, we all know what that's like. We've all had some kind of visitation or some kind of weird feeling that there's a spirit in the land or in our house or, or someplace where we're visiting. So a very important part of shamanism has always been to keep the middle world as clear as possible where those of us who are here for earth school are learning our lessons and those of us who need to transcend have left the middle world. Now the grieving part, those of us who were left with um, our loved ones uh, gone, that's a process that takes time and in, in shamanism grieving is such an important part of, of our work because um, we really, we, we have to take the time. I remember, um, I remember going to a bank and working with a banker and he said to me, my mother just died and I'm in such a state of grief, but my bank made me come back to work immediately. We don't give people the time to grieve like people did in indigenous cultures doing ceremonies. Um, making sure that they're in a good place, making sure that we honor them. When I lead uh, ceremonies for funerals, which I love to do, um, I always have people tell a funny story about um, the person who left. And I go around the group and have people share a story about the person who died. And then we all release that person part, part, of the healing for that uh, person who's deceased is being released by everyone who loves them instead of being pulled back down here. I hope that makes some sense. Yeah. Um, I'm going to just throw this out. Um, we happen to live uh, with uh, Indian burial mounds uh, about a mile due west of us. And it is a forest preserve. You know, you can walk around through it, uh, you know, and, um, you know, we do regularly. Um, it always has a slightly unwelcoming quality. And, you know, just trying to tune in myself to whatever's going on there. I um, kind of got the impression that the people who lived there a thousand years ago. And, and this is, you know, this is the way it came to me. Decided to become local nature spirits and mm -hmm. just become guardians of the land. And, you know, uh, they're not too friendly to, to the newcomers. Mm -hmm. um, that's just my own sole impression. Does that make any sense from uh, your point of view? Oh, absolutely. I, I found um, in my 40 years of teaching and traveling, whether I'm traveling to teach or not, uh, the very first thing I do is journey to the local ancestors. And I just learned this on my own of um, going to workshops and we were flooded out. The weather was always bad. We couldn't do our ceremonies. And it finally came to me that there are ancestors just like you shared that ch choose to stay here to protect the land. And that's something that's known. 
So what I tell people is always use the word helping when you call in the helping ancestors of the land. Use the word helping because that means you're dealing with divine, not deceptive beings. Um, because in the middle world, if people haven't crossed over, they can cause some problems. They're not divine beings. They're still stuck here. They haven't transcended yet. And so um, I always say to the ancestors of the land, um, I'm bringing a group. Uh, we're really open-hearted people, but we don't know your ways. We don't know your ways, but we really want to learn how to bring healing how to bring balance back to this great earth. Will you please, um, will you please honor us as we do our work and help us as we do our work? And I can tell miracle story after miracle story of what has happened when I started doing that. You know, storms would clear, hurricanes would clear so we could do our ceremonies. We've always been supported, but I always have to call in the helping ancestors first. So the very first beings before I ever travel, I, I will not travel to a place until I journey and talk to the local spirits, tell them the intention, who I'm bringing, and ask for their permission to come. If I'm traveling on a vacation, I do exactly the same thing. I'm coming to your land to rest. Um, will you help to make this trip um, without obstacles um, for me? So I believe talking to the helping ancestors is one of the most important things that we need to do before we step onto land that is not our home. Yeah, it occurs to me that this may be one of the problems in the American psyche. Now, I was a student in England for a couple of years, and I had many friends there, still do. And I had a sense that their connection with the land, particularly those that are sensitive in the ways we're talking about, is very different from ours, because the spirit, they are the descendants of the ancestors of that land. Their ancestors uh, have been there for thousands of years. So they're their children. Here, there's a radical break because a lot of the Indians were exterminated, as we know. The white men came in as invaders. And so there seems to be this break in the American psyche between um, you know, kind of who we are and our con connection not only to the land, but to the spirits of the land. Could you uh, address that a little bit? Yeah, I, I talked about that a lot in my earlier books of that. I think um, I think if you don't honor your ancestors and you don't know who your ancestors are, which is happens to a lot of us in America, you have no future. Um, you need a, a pet, you know, there's a line, there's past, present and future. And and there is no future when you don't care who your ancestors are or you don't honor them in any way. And so for me, this has been a big issue in that um, my ancestors did immigrate to um, escape being murdered and wiped out. And when they came to America, what all they wanted to do was integrate. They just wanted to integrate. It was really important to them. And so what happened was throughout my life, I could never get anybody to tell me about my relatives. So up until I started working with Ancestry a year ago, I didn't know where my grandfather came from my own grandfather, because I asked his own sister, his own sister in America, and she said, I don't know, and why do you want to know? So to me, it's a real illness of our culture, because in right now, if you go to an indigenous culture for healing, uh, and you, you say you're from America, the very first thing they're going to do is try to connect you to your ancestors. 
because they see one of the biggest uh, causes of illness in America right now is where we have no connection with our ancestors. And from a shamanic point of view, it's our ancestors who have our back. Our ancestors want us to be successful. They want us to be healthy. They want us to be happy. But we reject our ancestors. And a lot of people in the West reject their ancestors because they were traumatized growing up. So they project it all the way back beyond their parents to their ancestors. And this is a real cause of illness because if we really honor our ancestors, we have more support than we ever realized. Um, and so, um, and a lot of people here don't want to know about their ancestors. And I find that unbelievably sad. I remember one of the first times I was teaching in Austria and somebody was translating for me at lunch and, and this man was talking about how he's still living lives in the house that his ancestors lived 900 years ago. That was beyond, I mean, I just couldn't believe it. I, I couldn't believe it. What would that feel like to be so connected um, to one's ancestors where I'm struggling just to find out where my ancestors came from? Of course, in a sense, most people in America either came here or descended from people who came here to get up, get away from someplace else. So this, uh, for whatever reason, so this break is, um, you know, kind of organic to the whole uh, structure of our nation. Um, but going on, uh, people who have worked with ancestral spirits often find that the ancestral spirits themselves need healing work. Could you talk a little bit about this? Yeah, I, I, I recently taught a class um, where I had people go back and ask their ancestors if they needed healing um, and what kind of healing that they needed. Again, through journeying, the power of journeying is so wonderful because we get answers, we get direct revelations. So I've been able to help a lot of people. Um, I have a, a colleague who just wrote a book that's becoming incredibly popular about how she was able to break a curse that had been going on and how she did it. I taught her how to journey and how to work with her ancestors. So through journeying, we can go back and say what stories need to be healed, what stories need to be changed. How can I change my behavior so I change the, the story of, of of our ancestors so that we're moving forward to a better life instead of repeating all the traumas that you've gone through. So there's healing that can happen. There's also information that we can get about changes we need to make so that we stop um, carrying forth all the looping um, behaviors that we do. We're, we're carrying all these stories in our DNA so oftentimes we just continue to live them out. To go on to another subject, a major theme of shamanic work is uh, working with power animals. Could you talk a little bit about power animals, uh, discovering them, interacting with them, um, enabling them to help you? Yeah, so that's what I was sharing uh, as uh, one form of helping spirits. So again, um, it's believed that when we come into this world that either a spirit of an animal or I keep calling them guardian spirits. You don't call a tree a power animal. You don't call um, a fairy a power animal. Um, you don't call uh, insects a power animal. So I use the word guardian spirits if it's not an actual animal, if you're not working with tiger, bear, eagle. And so again, the entire species um, 
actually volunteers itself to protect you uh, when you're born. And so uh, you wouldn't have an eagle as a power animal, you have eagle as power animal. You have the whole species that is protecting you um, energetically. And so um, uh, power animals can live in the lower world. Power animals can live in the upper world. Again, they live in the transcendent realities and are considered divine beings. And they come into our lives and, um, and help us work with us in healing. So for me, I work with a guardian spirit that you would call a power animal but um, he does all my healing work where my teacher in the upper world, she helps me with my writing, uh, with um, my teaching, developing my courses to help the planet where my helping spirit is for me, for my questions and for my clients. He does all healing work on my clients. For other people, um, their power animals uh, would be um, more um, beings that they go to for special, special things that um, their teacher won't help them with. So we have a variety of spirits and power animals are just one of them. And again, that was the point I was trying to make before is the very first thing a modern day practitioner will do is when they journey to meet their power animal, they'll, they'll run to some symbol book and look up the meaning of their power animal instead of realizing that their power animal came to them for something incredibly specific that um, that it's a gift, it's a strength, it's something that they're bringing to that person that they're not bringing to another human being on the planet. So um, power animals come to us for very individual reasons. And that's part of the discipline and that's part of the practice is when you journey and you meet a power animal, why did they come into your life? What do they have to teach you? Show, show me um, your wisdom. So I try to teach the discipline of how to develop a strong relationship with a power animal so that they're really your buddy instead of you going to some book and, and having, well, I'm not sure that really makes sense to me or or all of a sudden you lose the gift that this power animal is bringing into your life because you think um, it means something else. So another example I can give is um, back in the 80s, um, people started, as I was traveling, I was teaching 40 workshops a year around the world, and people would keep giving me gifts. And all of a sudden, one year, people kept giving me a gift that had an owl, an owl fetish, an owl uh, feather, and then somebody gave me an owl mask, and I said, okay, something's going on with owl. Why is owl coming into my life? So instead of running to a book, I took a journey, and I said, why is owl coming into my life? And my guardian spirit came to me, and he said, um, it's not that owl sees in the dark. Owl has a particular radar that you're going to need soon. And then the journey just stopped. The journey just ended. And I kind of let it go because soon in shamanism, when you journey, you're outside of time. So soon in shamanism can mean, um, you know, another lifetime. <laughs> but soon actually revealed itself very quickly to me. I was teaching a workshop in St. Louis and I had to come back uh, late at night because I had clients on Monday and I'm on a plane and uh, there's no lights and the, the crew is walking up and down the aisles with flashlights and all of a sudden the captain comes on and he goes, I bet you're wondering what's happening. And I thought to myself, no, I'm not wondering what's happening. And um, he said, well, we've lost our radar. 
and he said, we're getting ready to go through a storm and I don't know how to get through it. <laughs> that was an interesting comment from him. Obviously we got through the storm, I'm still here. It was back in the eighties, but what a lesson I got. My, pow my what you would call a power animal, I publicly call him a power animal, but he's a guardian spirit told me I was going to need radar soon. And here I am in a plane and the pilot saying we have no radar. Now, if I would have gone to a book and looked up owl, there's no book on the planet that talks about owl having the gift of radar. I would have missed probably the biggest lesson of my life that the universe was trying to protect me from an event before it happened by giving me a spirit that could help. I would have missed that. I mean, what an amazing lesson to get that the universe was knew something was going to happen to me in the future and was giving the help that I needed in the present. I mean, I would have missed that lesson if I would have gone to a book. That's a, that's, a, that's a great story. Well, it seemed that not only individuals, but collective entities also have uh, guardian spirits of the kind you're talking about. Uh, obviously, many uh, Indian tribes do. And it occurs to me to ask, what would you say would be the guardian spirit of the United States? Oh, I have no idea. I'd have to journey on it. I've never journeyed on it. I've, I've journeyed on power animals for people's businesses. I've journeyed for um, power animals for people's families. I've journeyed for power animals for pe couples. Um, but I never journeyed for the power animal of the United States. And uh, shamanism, we don't think. We journey. Um, we do direct revelation. So, um, so I, I have no thoughts on this. I have no idea. <laughs> well, it is a funny question. Uh, of course, um, the debate about choosing, um, you know, the national bird um, yeah. way back founding father's times would lead one to think that, you know, the eagle would be the obvious choice. But as you say, you know, I haven't journeyed on this either, so yeah. I'm not going to say. Um, well, this has all been um, extremely uh, helpful and um, interesting. Um, I'm coming to the end of the questions um, I can think of. Do you have any anything else you would like to add particularly? Well, uh, the one thing that I'd like to share is that um, we are, as a collective, going through a very dark time. And from a shamanic point of view, it's what's called an initiation. Um, we're actually being initiated where our ego is being stripped um, so that we can step into a higher consciousness. And so that's actually what's going on in the planet right now with all this dissolution and all this destruction and everything that's happening in people's lives is we are experiencing an amazing amount of loss but that loss is the loss of um, unhealthy ways of thinking and unhealthy ways of living and so as our ego gets stripped and as our mind can no longer figure out a solution from a shamanic point of view that's when the power of our spirit steps in and it's the power of our spirit that knows everything. Our spirit is a, a reflection of source. It is a reflection of the creative powers of the universe. So we have all this knowledge that's within us, but it's covered up by our ego. It's covered up by advertising. It's covered up by um, you know, social media, you know, we lose what our spirit is really trying to evolve um, to. And so we're going through a powerful time of loss, but this is a time that's bringing us to a place where we can remember 
why we're here, um, that we are nature, that we're not connected to nature, we are nature. There's only oneness, there's only love, and there's only light. And so that's where this initiation is trying to take us to. And so it's really important to find, if it's not shamanism, find practices that help you learn how to tune into nature, learn how to uh, read the signs that the universe is giving us moment to moment through omens, and learn how to um, work with some kind of discipline so that you can go deep and you can let your ego be stripped and you can feel the amazing feeling that happens when your life is filled with spirit and all of a sudden there's a knowing um, there's no fear you're dropping into a place of honor kindness um, compassion and you realize that you're walking forward with a whole uh, community of people to creating a different story than the story that we're living right now. And so with all the pain and suffering that's happening right now, this is actually a really positive time. It's a difficult time. It's a time when we need to hold space for each other and see each other in our own light and our own divine perfection. So I guess that's what I wanted to add. <laughs> well, thank you. That's very inspirational. I think that's a very inspirational way to end this interview. So uh, why don't we conclude it here? Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and an honor to uh, spend an hour with you. And um, of course, I wish you all the best in all of your enterprises. Thank you so much. And thank you for the brilliant work you're doing too.